So welcome, thank you very much indeed for coming tonight. A um, few simple reminders. So um, there is no fire practice planned, so if the alarm does go off it will be for real. Let's hope it doesn't. And the fire exits are marked. Uh, there's the main stairs there that you came up, um, but also this fire exit here. Um, and the assembly area is on, on the lawns. Right, more instructions to read out. Um, can you keep your phones on, but switch them to silent or vibrate? Um, and you can leave them on because we'd like you to tweet if you do that stuff. Um, and the using hashtag, all one word, Project Quantum. Okay, so that's that. And we are live streaming the event on Facebook Live and Periscope. Thank you, Ashley. And uh, we are being videoed. Um, we like a permanent record of these lectures so that they can be made available to, to a very large audience and, and be available for posterity. I mean, goodness knows, people may be interested in, in 50 years' time, they may be interested in what we're doing now. Um, we've got a photographer with us. Click, 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 click. Um, and if, if you're worried about your photograph being used for any purpose, then just let one of the team, Rosie or uh, any other member of the team, know. Um, our next seminar will be in 9th of October, um, which is Chris Winch. Um, and he's done a great deal of work recently on teacher expertise. This is, this is quite important in terms of, of teacher assessment, integrating assessment to learning and so on. And when I asked Chris to do it, he said, but I've only just given a lecture. I said, Chris, it was 10 years ago. <laughs> you know, time flies and it is on your latest work. And Chris is a great speaker, he really is. Very plugged in. He's a philosopher of education, but very, very interesting. His empirical work is impeccable. Final note here, which is important, is we put together a, an introductory course to assessment. We, we figured it was really important for the, the, the scary nature of assessment for many people to be debunked in very accessible materials. And, and so we put something together called A101, which was very ably put together by the network team and, and specialists that they used in developing it. And, and that course the leaflets are downstairs. We've got extraordinary interest in it. We've got delegates from over 15 countries around the world. Um, so, so, and, and it's just, just taken off. We can't believe the interest in it. Um, so, sort of more popular stuff about assessment, absolutely quantum. Um, so I've had the privilege of working with Simon Payton-Jones Payton uh, on this project for, for a long time now. Um, long time in terms of its inception, our growing enthusiasm about it, and then the extraordinary work which, which Simon um, and other colleagues in the team and Mars Berry have done to, to, to make it real, to actually get it going. And, and what we were excited about was the fact that we, we could tackle some problems in the supply of high quality questions in relationship to computing science. So, a couple of anecdotes that aren't in the historical record, so let's put them down here. Um, the first one is that um, I had a phone call from Simon, who was um, quite rightly um, talking to me in 2010 about the fact that the ICT curriculum was moribund and very problematic. Um, we we had picked, certainly picked this up in 2010, 2011, when we were doing work on the review of the national curriculum, we absolutely picked up that kids were saying, oh, we've got to do this ICT curriculum, and we learn more about the things they're telling us about at school by doing it at home than the teachers know about it in school, which was a pretty grim situation because it was undermining the authority of teachers, undermining the authority of schools. What we, what we entered into was a very interesting discussion about what we should be doing in respect of preparing young children for a world in which digitization of, of anything and everything would be commonplace. Not only in respect of everyday life, but also in terms of trying to make us, again, a powerhouse of production in relationship to digital technologies. I had conversations with people at ARM and, and, and friends who work in technology companies around Cambridge, and they all said, we have no idea where the next generation is going to come from. We all messed around with BBC Bs when we were in our bedrooms. Um, that's not what the ICT curriculum teaches kids to do. It doesn't encourage them 
to get dirty in terms of what actually goes on in terms of applications. So Simon phoned me and, and talked about this and said, we've got to have um, a revised uh, computing curriculum as part of the revised national curriculum that, that you're currently <coughs> advising on. And I said, no, I don't think, I, actually, no, not at all. Um, I don't want anything to do with computing in the national curriculum because it, it's just other bits of other subjects. It's bits of maths, it's, it's bits of science, it's a bit of communication. Um, I could hear this sli slight start on the end of the phone. Um, and I said, just, just, just prove that that isn't the case. And, and we amicably stopped the conversation. And about a few months later, um, Simon asked me over to headquarters and I think laid down a compelling case for the distinctive character of activity, learning activities, constructs, and outcomes in respect to computing science. Not only that, um, I, he and colleagues did a brilliant job on the computing science component of the national curriculum. Now, I think it's good, but I don't say it's brilliant because I think so. Uh, I say it's brilliant because it's been read by um, leading organizations and individuals around the world, including in Silicon Valley, who say this is an extraordinary development in education. Far better than the things that we see around the world in terms of preparing children for uh, a contemporary society and contemporary economy. So that's great. But the trouble is, all we've got is a brilliant national curriculum, which actually is a few words on a page. We've got to make it real. I mean, we've got to support teachers, many teachers in schools who are not specialists, who think that it's, it's you know, all being done if you just have Coding Cub and five kids in your school are participating in that. Yep, we've met the requirements of the national curriculum. No, you haven't. So we, 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 we realized we had to do something and do something fast. And we realized that rich questions associated with that curriculum are a really, really powerful way of communicating the depth of treatment of particular ideas and particular operations and skills, what it is you're expecting somebody to learn and expecting them to do. And, and those rich questions can also give rise to a very, very rich pedagogy um, operating on the ground. So that's what we decided. And then we thought, well, how the hell are we going to get the volume of questions that we actually need? Um, Simon being Simon and Mars being Mars and the world that they inhabit um, in CAS, um, computing in schools, they said, let's crowdsource it. And it didn't take long for us to decide that that was an incredibly good idea. I won't go into the details of this, um, but it breaks with the tradition that assessment is, among teachers, that a, assessment is A, scary, um, because it's very technical, um, B, that it's only done by, the, the item development is only done by specialists, and questions are associated with oppressive summative assessment linked to accountability measures. So why would you want more assessment going on in the classroom? So the more assessment is interesting. I've lectured around the world saying that you know, teachers in England say, you know, it's in the press, uh, month after month, year after year, that we are the most assessed system in the world and we're grossly over-assessed. Uh, and neither of those things are empirically correct. We are not the most assessed system in the world. For goodness sake, we only assess a few bits and pieces once in a while. And then we have a diet of GCSEs and A-levels. Um, but compared with some other nations, including Finland, I mean, Finland, there's loads more formal testing in primary schools than here. And of course, it's interesting. Teachers say that, and then they buy loads more tests from GL or from Durham. Well, that's interesting. You know, those tests they have more faith in because they can decide when to use them. They can decide when to use them in respect of the results being helpful in terms of learning. Now that we all fed into Project Quantum. We thought what we want to do is to have a huge volume of items in computing science. And we get to the quality by adding additional quality assurance measures on top, which Simon and Mars will go into. So actually, I would 
Project Quantum simply realizes the idea that we need much more assessment of a very different kind, giving a, 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 a wide variety of questions, which, which give, give an idea of how you converge in on these key ideas that, we, that are required in a computing science national curriculum or computing science curri school curriculum, um, which is hopefully leading edge. Um, it's been a great privilege working with Simon on this. It's been a great privilege working with Mars on this. It's been great fun as well. And, and one of the great things is it seems to be working, which is quite useful. Um, the name, um, I can lay claim to the name. We had, a big, <laughs> we had a big discussion on the phone about what the name should be. And I think I thought something Latinate would be a good idea. Um, it's got all sorts of weird resonances, <coughs> the idea of quantum, and that's quite good. Um, and, and you've capitalised on, on those resonances in the title, Simon, so that's wonderful. So, so that kind of situates it in where we are. And, and if we can break this idea that you know, high-quality items only come from a very small coterie of specialists, I think we will have contributed something quite fundamental to education. Not least that teachers can feel more ownership of assessment because they've created the items. That's something very, very close to my heart. So really enriching learning and, and improving the trust between assessment organisations, curriculum, the national curriculum and schools. Okay, so Simon, I won't, I won't describe... You can describe yourself, Mars. You, you can very... You, you'll describe each other probably because of your, the way you're box and cox during this presentation. But thank you very much indeed for being prepared to come to talk to us this evening. Great. Thank you. <coughs> well, it's a uh, rather a pleasure and a privilege to be here as a pointy-headed computer scientist to be invited to address the august uh, Cambridge Assessment Assemble audience is indeed um, <coughs> quite a big thing. Um, I, so I am a computer scientist. I'm a research computer scientist. I work at Microsoft Research. My day job is computer science research, not education, but I became deeply involved in the um, school computing curriculum, um, and uh, through, the, through that meant Tim. Um, so we're going to do this talk as a kind of double act. I'll start. Miles will take over. Um, and um, uh, and it would be more fun, although the tradition of these talks is that we'll have a, you know, a conversation at the end, which, uh, which I hope we'll have a more extended to and fro. Uh, it would be kind of reassuring if you would make, sort of make quest uh, you know, ask questions or um, clarifying questions or make, even make comments as we go along. That would reassure me that you're still there, right? Not just listening very respectively, but probably sleepily, right? It is, after all, um, <clears throat> four o'clock in the afternoon. Okay, so... I want to start with an image which is of the tank and a worm. So the tank is the English national curriculum. Uh, the date is around 2010. And the worm, or worms, are the uh, computing at school guerrilla group who were unhappy with the state of play in um, uh, computing, but didn't feel able, you know, the, the worm and the, it's hard for worms to alter the course of progress of a tank. However, at that moment, the captain of the tank invited a navigator to help him figure out where the tank should go. And the navigator was Tim. So Tim was appointed as chair of this um, uh, curriculum review committee, which you modestly didn't um, mention earlier on. Um, and that was why I was phoning him up. So with gr the greatest trepidation, I phoned the great um, Tim Oates. In, uh, so I was rather terrified about this. And eventually, we did get to meet. Um, and uh, actually, rather a lot then happened, which I shall elide, um, so uh, over a period of several years. And finally, we got this. So this is the, the new English national curriculum that Tim referred to. These are the aims, which I put up here, because still several years on, I'm still quite proud of them. Look here. So that every child from, from primary school onwards should be able to understand and apply the fundamental principles of computer science. Um, and have repeated practical experience of solving problems. This means, this means a bit about programming and application, um, but without throwing overboard all the important stuff about information and communication technology and being c capable, confident users of computers that were in the old ICT curriculum. So it's a, quite a balanced set of aims. Nevertheless, as Tim alluded to, that leaves us with a big challenge, which is how to turn that vision which is a sort of aspirational vision here, seeing computer science and indeed computing generally as a subject discipline like you might think of maths or physics or chemistry um, and not a uh, you know, purely technologically focused vocational subject. Switching to think of it as a subject discipline is a major change and our, our teachers are typically not, they, very few teachers have computer science degrees because 
at the stage in the ICT curriculum was, it wasn't very attractive to be a computer scientist than to be an ICT teacher, right? Because you weren't teaching your subject discipline. Now you are, so that will change over time. But nevertheless, we have a sort of immediate problem. So, what to do about that? Well, we can do lots of things. We can do training, um, you know, and build hubs and have regional centers and so forth. We're trying to do all of those things. But in addition, what, what could we do centrally that, we could, that could help? And so it was a great surprise to me to figure out with, with uh, you know, in discussion with Tim, that one answer to that question was to help them with assessment. Now, I previously thought of assessment as being deeply boring, really, the kind of thing you, you know, you just kind of have to do at the end of the course, right? But uh, it took me... Um, some while to realize actually that all teachers need to have an opinion. If they've got six students, you can figure out roughly how well each student is doing and where they're each stuck. If you've got 600, you need a more, you know, some more systematic way of figuring out which ones are understanding things and which ones are not. And indeed, for the students themselves to help them understand, you know, you go to lesson, I go to it, lots of talks at Microsoft, and I kind of think I understand what the speaker is speaking about, but if I actually had to do it, I discover that it didn't really. The act of answering questions is incredibly helpful in figuring out whether I understand something, and if not, where I don't. So, um, so actually, a lot of question answering goes on in schools. Probably not enough, as Tim is saying, right? But nevertheless, a lot does. And the, the big thing is, where do these questions come from? Well, in maths, you know, you have a cornucopia of riches. We have hundreds of years of teaching maths and an enormous corpus of material to draw on for uh, finding questions. But in computing, not so much, right? Certainly at school level, kind of a handful of years rather than hundreds of years. That makes a big difference. So what happens in practice? Teachers make up questions. Is this a good idea? It's very bad from a workload point of view, and everybody is worried about teacher workload, especially teachers, right? It's hard work inventing good questions. Secondly, even experts find it difficult to write questions that are good, right? It's difficult to do that. Um, even if you know the subject well, um, inventing good questions is hard. Um, and then, then there's the marking workload, which you have to, uh, to undertake. So the danger is that we'll, what we'll end up with is, is with a, a heavy workload for teachers on making up questions and marking them, and getting a corpus of not very good questions that test things that are not what we want to measure. The whole point about assessment for learning is you would like the questions to reflect what it is that we want students to learn. But the easy questions to set may be things like, where do the semicolons go in a Java program? Right? It's easy to set. It's one of the first things you'd think about, maybe. But, um, but it's, not, it's not the important things, right? The important things are somehow deeper, somehow harder to articulate. And that's why the questions about them are harder to write. OK? So, um, the, uh, and, and worst of all, all of this sort of you know, not, not very good state of affairs is then duplicated in thousands and thousands of classrooms across the land. It seems completely nuts, doesn't it? So what's the obvious thing to do that would uh, you know, reduce workload and increase quality? Develop some kind of online corpus of questions that is freely available to all teachers everywhere um, that would somehow embody the subject. So this comes back to what Tim was saying about, um, uh, well, I forget what words you use, but I, I put it, I put it is, is that it can incarnate the subject in tangible form. Right, if you have a sentence in the national curriculum that says um, you know, something about computational abstractions, what on earth does that mean, really? If you have 100 questions that are about that topic, then you have 100 sort of concrete instances of this rather abstract idea. And that might make much more sense both to teachers and to students. So that's what I mean. By incarnate, I mean, I mean sort of make flesh, um, make concrete in a tangible way. So. Um, and this is a big help for, uh, particularly if we're trying to, um, uh, to give some guidance on what teachers might teach in this rather new subject. Then having a corpus of questions that embodies the subject that we hope they'll teach will be incredibly helpful both to them um, and also to make sure they're going to teach the right subject. Does that make sense? That's the goal. That's the goal. Um, and moreover, then it can be useful, you know, it, it, if you save the work once, it's not like uh, once you've, if you'd run a training course face to face, with uh, 100 people, like, like in this room, then you do the course, and it's done. You might have a video, you might have some training materials, but the, the highest value face-to-face -face thing, that happens once and it's gone. This is a permanent asset, or could be. 
So that's the idea. That was the sort of aspirational vision. And it sort of fitted in very closely with this report in 2015, which was commissioned by the Department of Education, and which um, um, you weren't actually on the panel, were you? But you were sort of, uh, it was kind of your hench people, friends and uh, drinking companions, wrote this. And one of the, uh, this was about assessment without levels. Do you remember about all the abolition of levels? So many of you will be familiar with this report. One of its recommendations was the establishment of a national item bank of assessment. Things, right? So this is exactly what quantum is about. So, um, and actually, surprisingly, you know, th nearly three years on, has anything happened about this recommendation? Actually not. Quantum is it at the moment, and we are making this point rather vigorously <laughs> to the <laughs> Department of Education. Okay, so there's a sort of, there's a, um, <clears throat> so it, now, if, if, if I was sitting in the audience and never heard of this before, I'd be asking two questions. One is, where are you going to get all these questions? And the second is, how are you going to know whether they're any good? And I want to say a bit about both of those questions, right? Because there is absolutely no point in assembling a large pile of bad questions. You're all a bit quiet, <laughs> sort of slightly ominous, but please, you know, do take seriously what I said earlier. So, at this point, right, so, so we're fa facing these questions. So I'd already started talking to Tim, and he, I think it was you who introduced me to, to Rob Coe. So these two shady characters then, um, I, in fact, what Rob then said, actually, we'd already begun to think about this crowdsourcing idea, because that was an idea they started to talk about, as a way to develop um, questions. Um, and also, we do know a bit about question quality. So, let's first of all start with... Um, how do we get good questions? So the standard way is to pay experts to write them. That's what Tim was referring to earlier. You, um, uh, you pay experts to write them, you field trial them, and you finish up with, you know, a few hundred, maybe a thousand if you've written a lot of questions. Good questions, but they're relatively expensive. And somehow that sets up all the incentive structures to say, ooh, you know, I don't have that many questions. So if I just put them all out there, then I won't be able to use them for, you know, end of course assessment. And, and the students will do them all, um, you know, will know what the questions are going to be in the test, so they, they won't be much good as tests. So if you have too few, right, then you, you tend to think, well, maybe I won't just put them out there publicly for everybody. And it tends to draw you towards the more high-stakes summative assessment end of the spectrum. Um, that's the sort of, that's the, that's the push. So quantum is going tr trying to go exactly to the opposite end of the spectrum and to say, what would happen, oh, beg your pardon, what would happen if we crowdsource the questions, right? So that any teacher anywhere could write a question and upload it to the, um, uh, to the quantum corpus. Um, so leaving aside quality at the moment, so then the idea is we get a lot of cheap questions. And so that suggests that our focus is very strongly on low-stakes formative assessment. So by this I mean... Um, uh, you know, the quiz at the end of the day or at the end of the week or the quiz you, you do actually in your class and the students answer it on their phone. And by the way, all of the students can see all of the questions all of the time. There's just so many of them that if a student aces a test because they have done 7,000 questions, good for them, <laughs> right? We praise them. We do not say you've been cheating. See the difference? It's a very different feel than the, the sort of summative story. Um, and so we're not thinking of it as a measurement of achievement, you know, have you succeeded in this course? There's still a role for that. It's just that quantum is not playing into that primarily. There might be a role for keeping some questions aside. It's just not our primary focus. Um, and we're very interested in using um, questioning as a form of pedagogy, and that's really where Miles, Miles is going to, Miles' is part of the talk is going to focus. Okay, so that's the idea. Could we crowdsource a lot of questions in this way? Um, so... One question would be, can you get enough questions that way? That is, will the crowd get into action? And the second might be, uh, you know, uh, what about quality? Let's deal with quality first. So that was where um, Rob and his colleagues at um, the Durham Center for Evaluation and Monitoring really came into their own. They said, actually, Simon, you know, this is old hat, right? We know nothing about computing, but we know an awful lot about assessment and about measuring quality. And rash analysis has been around for years. And um, it can tell us... Uh, given a large corpus of answers, which questions are good? And the way I have come to understand it is this. I'm not an expert on rash analysis, but let me just tell you my take on it, and those of you who know can tell me if I've got this wrong. So imagine that you have millions of answers to thousands of questions written by, uh, and the answers provided by thousands of students. Now, if you knew how strong each student was on some kind of linear scale, 
then you could determine which, the, which questions were any good because the good questions would discriminate strong students from weak students and the bad questions would simply be sort of random. They wouldn't discriminate at all. Moreover, the good questions would discriminate but only at a certain point in their level of difficulty, right? If you give a question, at, at an A-level question to a primary school child, then you're likely to get, you know, random answers. Um, and uh, so, so, so there'll be a sort of knee in the curve at which... Uh, you know, at some level of competence for a student, they'll start to get the answers right. So you can, if you knew how strong the students were, you could figure out for each question, is it any good and how hard is it on some somewhat arbitrary linear scale? Let's keep it very simple for the moment. I was worried that this was too simple, but Rob and Tim tells me it's not too simple, it's just about okay. Yeah? Does any of that also answer the question about does it help them learn? No, it doesn't directly answer that question at all. No. Um, so, I mean, there, there are some big unanswered questions, which, you know, which would be, you know, or the, the level of sort of educational research, what kind of questioning aids learning? Miles will have a bit to say about that. Um, but I think all we're, we're trying to do the sort of, as it were, the first step is to discover, does it discriminate? Um, and then I suppose there's a larger hypothesis is, even if you had a questions that do discriminate, do they help learning? Now, there's a lot of work. Daisy Christodoulou, um, 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 uh, Dylan William, all that kind of... But, that's not my expertise. But ask Tim and Miles, but later. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. So, um, sorry, oh, there is a microphone. Yes, sorry, I, should, I will repeat the question if you haven't got the microphone. Okay. Um, but you can have the microphone as well. That would be good. Um, oh, I really yeah. don't need one. No, yeah. such a loud voice. Anyway. <laughs> um, but there are people um, listening so, online. Right, yes, okay. So my question is, um, aren't we getting stuck into a circle here where we're... Um, using questions to assess how good students are at answering more questions. Mm -hmm. And is any, we, we ask this question, yeah. does, this, does this support learning? But what are they actually learning? Just the right answers to questions. So, so there's no yeah. doing in this. No, no, no. So, so quantum is not a silver bullet, right? It is not all of the learning you would want to do, right? So I want students to write programs, for example. Exactly. Um, I definitely want them to do that. So it's not a, you know, it's not, it's not a, this is going to be the solution to all your teaching and learning problems. It's kind of one, one weapon in your armour. But unless you calibrate this against the doing, it becomes, um, it's cast adrift from it. It's a separate set of, like, l guessing the right answers to verbal questions. Let's say about abstraction, which was the example uh -huh. you gave. I can teach students to answer questions about abstraction correctly, but that is quite different from what they need to do to be good at computer science. I wonder, so, so the, the question is, could you, I mean, Miles, are you, you, are you wanting to respond to this? Um, say something. Uh, it may I, mean, not be a particularly I, good I would answer. say that you, your goal is to write questions which you cannot answer simply by having memorized something, which you can only answer by having understood the concept, the underlying construct. Thank you. Sorry, attention to pin yeah. and then turn on a microphone. I can just talk there. Um, I think with computer science or computing, because we ought to recognize that there's a breadth to it beyond just computer science, we've got a couple of things going on. This idea of capability. I'm seeing as having components of knowledge and the application of that knowledge. And of course I want them to do project work, and of course I want teachers assessing the project work. But if I give you a scratch project, can you tell from what the child has done whether they understand the idea of abstraction or not? It seems that it may actually be more efficient and probably more reliable to ask them a, a good question which gets at their understanding of the, the concept there. So questions for assessing knowledge and project work for assessing the application of that skills if you want to. Both and, not either or, please. OK. So this, and this, this, these quality metrics here, oh, we'll make a I got halfway through, didn't I? We got as far as. If we know how strong every student is, we could come up with a, a measure of how hard the question was and which were the good questions. But we don't know how strong the students are. If, on the other hand, we knew which were the good questions and how hard they were, we could figure out how strong each student was. But we don't know that either. But if we have enough data, we can figure out both at the same time. That's the idea. It's just a sort of best fit problem. Um, and that's what rash analysis does. Okay. So uh, you have to be careful about placing too much credence in these numbers, but at least if you have a lot of data, 
um, then you might reasonably hope to get reasonably objective ideas about at least which, qu uh, which questions are good discriminators and how hard they were on some somewhat arbitrary scale. Okay, that's the, that's the promise here. And then we want to provide that evidence as feedback to the author, right? So the author can say, oh, I thought that question was really cool, but actually monkeys would answer it better than the students did. That's really weird. I wonder why. Um, and also to teachers in choosing questions when they can say, oh, my students are working at, you know, uh, around about 65 along this arbitrary scale. I want to pick questions in a sort of band around there, um, where, you know, within the topic area that I'm interested in. That would be really helpful to them. If you're talking about a really large corpus of questions, but it's not so. So this analysis, of course, is not just it's not all um, the quality feedback mechanisms we want. We now kind of have other quality feedback mechanisms. There's, we have a significant element of central moderation and curation um, that say you know at least does this question contain offensive material? So all questions go through that before it gets they get they get put up. Um, but then some element and some element of tagging to say what is the topic about and that that say somebody's got to look at it. Say is it even about computer science? Maybe it's a question about geography. That would not be uh, such a helpful question to do um, uh, rash analysis on in a computing topic. Um, there's a sort of per question dialogue thread in which teachers who use the question can give feedback to the author. Um, uh, we talked about tagging, and also simply assembling questions into quizzes. So a large pool of questions is a bit difficult to manage, but you, teachers then assemble <coughs> questions into quizzes, which they can share the quizzes as well. So that's another crowdsourced mechanism. Every teacher who forms a quiz to give to their students can make it available to other teachers. And that is also a curation mechanism, because they have decided those questions were useful to put in their quiz. So it's a sort of implicit curation mechanism. So there's a number of sort of human side things. And of course, nothing here, nothing except perhaps the, this part is really going to deal with coverage. What areas are missing, right? The rationality is not going to tell you that. OK? That's the plan. Now, to execute on that plan, we need scale, right? So one, uh, what have I got? One corpus of 30,000 questions is much, much more valuable than 10 of 3,000. Why? It's because a big corpus is, um, is more attractive to the teachers using it because they're more likely to find questions that are going to be useful to them. And once, they, once, so once they're drawn in, then they'll think, oh, but it's missing some questions in a particular area that I'm interested in, so I'll write some questions there just to fill it out. Um, the other thing, that we, the other place where scale is really helpful is that you get more reliable results from this statistical stuff if you have a bigger corpus of data. Um, okay. Uh, and... Um, and it's, this, this, this is just worth noting that even though different countries have different curricula, the actual subject concept, um, concepts and uh, constructs in the um, uh, don't vary a lot, right? Computer science is kind of the same anywhere in the world, um, and same with geography or, even, or Latin or maths, right? So um, you might organize into different quizzes, putting different material in different order, but the actual, the raw material is much the same. And I really like the idea that teachers in one part of the world could actively be helping teachers in a completely different part of the world without having to lift a finger. That's amazing. At the moment, we're terribly siloed. Okay. So what are we doing about this? This is our, so, so, the, so much for the aspiration. What we actually did, we formed, formed a partnership. So this is, um, we've already talked about the Durham Centre for Evaluation and Monitoring. That's Bob Coe and his colleagues. Um, Tim at Cambridge Assessment. That was, so they were sort of majoring at helping us on the quality side. On the um, content side, it was Miles and me and some colleagues at Computing at School, which was this organisation that was trying to help teachers um, deliver the new t teaching curriculum. And then we were introduced to what was then called Diagnostic Questions, now called ED, a small UK startup that ha already had a platform that did almost exactly what we wanted. It was already crowdsourced. It already had a large number of maths questions. So have any of you heard of Craig Barton? He's a sort of celebrity maths teacher. Um, he is one of the co-founders of Diagnostic Questions. And as a result, DQ has you know, 30,000 maths questions, and he has a very interesting series of blog posts in which he describes how to use this stuff. Um, so they're, they're our platform. I'm always a bit worried when people talk about platforms in talks about um, teaching and learning, because as if a new platform or a new portal is going to solve a problem. Platforms and portals don't solve problems, but they are sometimes the means to solving. And here we really did need a single place. We can only get this data in one place if we can have a platform to put it on, right? A single place where students answer their questions. And this was readily available to us. And they're, so they've been, they've been very active and supportive um, partners in this. They're now called, it was called Diagnostic Questions, they're now called ED, for reasons that I've never been able to figure out. 
Thought Diagnostic Questions was a great name for a company. But there you go. Um, he's a very, very wonderful partner. Um, <clears throat> so, brief acknowledgement. This, this, so this has been a two-year project funded by, um, not by the Department of Education, uh, alas, thus far, but by um, Google, Microsoft, and ARM, working shoulder to shoulder. One of the nice things about whole computing stuff is that um, fierce competitors at one level are working shoulder to shoulder at another, which is great. Okay, now, so what are we trying to do? Two things at once which is somewhat unusual. One, be a delivery project that is actually help computing teachers in the near term to do a better job right, and to reduce their workload. Two, be a research project in which, because really there are research questions here, right? Does crowdsourcing questions in this way work at scale? Does it help actually help te you know, students to learn more? Um, even, you know, how do you even answer that question? Um, uh, then there's sort of questions of adoptions. Will teachers actually use it? Um, and, um, um, and, and there's a whole bunch of other things you could ask around here because this is kind of new, what we're trying to do. Um, so, but we're, and, and the two feed off each other. They're symbiotic. The, um, uh, the research informs the delivery part because, we're, because of all this rash analysis stuff, right, that we, is, um, uh, we wouldn't have been able to do if we were just you know, whizzing up a quick platform. And the delivery at scale gives us the data that is going to be useful in the research side. So the two are very much symbiotic, which is really nice. Um, here is what we've done so far. So it's been two years so far. We've, um, uh, we've got around 8,000 collect questions collected over the last two years. This is a graph over time. Um, we're not quite at 8,000. I should say most of these are, I think the majority are either donated to us. For example, OCR gave us a large collection of um, questions that they'd used um, by way of preparatory material for um, their GCSE. So thank you, OCR. And a number of other people have been very generous in essentially giving to us or making available for free to us their sort of question corpuses. Um, we've also found it's worked quite well to ask teachers to write questions. Just saying, let's crowdsource, that's like magic pixie dust. Right? You say, just um, the crowd will leap into action. Actually, the crowd is awfully busy teaching. Right? But it turns out that motivated teachers, with, um, you know, once they get the idea, if you give them you know, quite small sums of money by way of a sort of commission or honorarium, they will write questions for you. But they think, you know, so that they're implicitly valued by doing so. So they've written a lot like that. Yes? How much money? <laughs> How much, so, I mean, it really is very small sums of money. It's like, it's like um, 100 pounds for 30 questions or something. I mean, really quite small sums of money if you, if you think of an expert question writer. Um, so I think these teachers are absolutely wonderful. They've worked very hard for very small sums of money, and I hope that what it's done is sort of validate and say it's important what you're doing here. Um, so I'm really grateful to them. They've written a lot of questions. Um, yes, at the back. What is the geographical spread of the people who wrote questions? Miles, I have no idea. Yeah. Most of the questions that we've got crowdsourced and indeed the commission stuff is from computer science or computing teachers in England. The bulk of the yep. forms is are questions of key stage three, bit of key stage four, some key stage five computer science. There's less for bribery, there's less for the other bits of the computer curriculum. There are questions from abroad, but most of this is, is English computing teachers, secondary computing teachers. Yep. Thanks. Was there somebody else? Yes. And uh, you said these 8,000 questions, are they all uh, validated and checked for uh, all these? Oh, are all 8,000 questions validated and checked? Yeah, I mean, are they all reliable? And no, they're not all reliable. No, no, no. No. So that, we need to look at the metrics for that, right? So they are moderated, right? None of them contain, you know, rude words. Um, <laughs> So by design, the barrier to entry is meant to be quite low. Um, and we're relying on these qu the quality mechanisms of you know, by-hand curation and rash analysis to try to figure out which are the good ones. So it is, it is not, you know, it, we cannot say that all these 8,000 questions are fantastic questions. I'd like to be able to say that, but I can't say that yet. Right? But I hope that you know, using the quality mechanisms we do, we will be able to know which ones are at least are, are decent. Okay, yes. Yes, I'm repeating the question, so online viewers will get to hear, uh, and indeed everybody here who's at the other side of the room. <clears throat> Is it automated to remove? 
Oh, is, it, is the removal, if they're not, you mean if their quality is low? No, we don't actually remove them. We just show to a teacher selecting them something that says it's not a very good question. So at the moment, we don't delete the question. Uh, that could come, I suppose. At the moment, we've, we've been concentrating on getting stuff in rather than kicking stuff out, if I'm honest. <laughs> uh, Mars will show you some data on um, how many we got. Of, yes, microphone here, but this time we'll have it switched on, maybe. <laughs> What about duplication of questions? Oh, what about duplication? There's probably quite a lot of duplication um, in which, you know, questions are uh, certainly in terms of, they're, they're probably not exact duplicates, but mm -hmm. questions that ask a similar question in a similar way, probably, yes. Mm -hmm. But we want that. Um, we want that. Because we want, we want, for example, begin to replicate what happens in Singapore and Shanghai in where, where people are actually asked multiple questions on an individual idea. Mm -hmm. I was it's a feature, to... not a bug. Yeah, in short. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I was when... just going to, to add that within ARD, which is Tim's division, we have developed statistical ways of looking for um, plagiarism and kind of duplication of material, which might be useful. Oh, I see. In yeah, terms of you mean kind of exact you duplicates? Get, mm -hmm. get rid of them. If I were an OCR teacher for 100 quid, if I could just copy and paste some past questions and send them off to you, it's quite tempting. <laughs> Surely OCR t teachers have higher ethical standards than that. <laughs> The, the, when we commission questions, we ask teachers to produce them in, in, sets of, in three sets of ten. So the notion was a sort of pretest of here are some questions that they, children could take at the start of the topic, then the sort of hinge point questions that they could use during the lessons, and then a sort of post-test thing of have they actually learned anything. And of course, you know, we want the same construct to be tested three times in that case, and we want to ideally see some sort of progression from the scores on the first lot. But so not identical question with identical words. No, no, no. Wording, the, 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 kind of no. They were carefully constructed so as to, to capture the same idea Caref for some values of carefully. Yes, um, I, I can just add on to that and then ask my question. Um, Craig Barton on his blog talked about using very similar questions after he's asked a question that students have stumbled mm. on have some discussion time, then you can ask a very similar question, see has something changed? Mm -hmm. So definite benefit of that. Um, my question was, um, talking rationalities, does this mean that all of these questions you're commissioning are multiple choice? Ah, yes, yes, yes. So they are all multiple choice questions. Um, so, uh, which is something I'll, 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 I'll say it now, I was going to say it later. Okay. This is all restricted to multiple choice for the moment for, and for several reasons. One is that's what the DQ platform did. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, and, and Craig and his colleague um, did that for a reason. I think we're, yes, we're getting echo from the microphone. So um, uh, second is we know how to do rash analysis for multiple choice questions. Um, and we don't, if you have a question with a free form answer, like an essay, we don't know how to do rash analysis for that. There's lots of computer mark things, like drag bits of code around. We don't, that, there's an interesting research question about how could you do sort of rash-like analysis for that. So, um, but the other thing to say about multiple choice, which Miles will say a little bit more, is I was terribly sniffy about this. I thought, multiple choice, that's for babies, isn't it? Um, and then I, was, I was, I, then I was told, no, 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 Simon, multiple choice is, is actually quite deep and insightful. And I've come to believe that myself, so. Yes, at the back. Um, do you test quality in terms of like uh, style and grammar and all those different things? We do not look for quality in terms of style and grammar. At, at most, it would be on the human written dialogue thread of a, of a question. Um, you know, a human saying, you know, this question is just badly posed or, or maybe uses complex English language and we're supposed to be testing computing. But you'd have to be a you know, native English speaker to understand it, that kind of thing. We don't have any automated way of testing that at the moment. No, that would be a nice thing to try. Yeah. Was somebody else at the back? Oh, no, fine. Okay. Yes? Well, uh, if you say that uh, questions are limited to multiple choice, does it lead to kind of memorization uh, question? Yeah, this is what I thought. So m doesn't multiple choice question equal memorization question? Uh, short answer, no. Longer answer, listen to Miles. <laughs> right? In a little while. Yes, over there. Uh, so I, I thought this too. So. Um, uh, have you done any uh, analysis of the data to give you sort of feedback on uh, whether there are kind of clusters of questions which are behaving differently? So, I mean, you might learn something about even the curriculum, but even to do automatic uh, tagging, for example, of topics and things? Not yet. Okay. But it would be the whole, this pile of data is like a treasure trove right. of stuff that you could mine in all sorts of ways. 
right? We're only just sort of scraping the, the most superficial bit. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, do you want to mention that we, we are collecting if, if they're submitted questions which are not multiple choice? Oh, yes, we're co right, yes, that's right. So, but there's not very much incentive for, for submission. People can upload questions that are not multiple choice questions, but they're not then presented by the system. So, but, so going beyond multiple choice is actually one of the questions we're leaving open at the end that we'd like to know you, get your feedback about. Let me just um, uh, move on quickly to, so I can hand over to Miles. Uh, so this is numbers of questions, right? So we're uh, with some reasonable kind of scales. Uh, at sc scale in terms of um, how much usage are we seeing? Around 100,000 question attempts a month. Now, that's not Mickey Mouse. That's not you know, one school with one class. I think we could be at least um, one and a half order, orders of magnitude more than this. Right, this is 100,000 questions a month uh, from around 10,000 students. 10,000 students, that's really small. A single cohort of students in England alone is 600,000 students. Right, so, we're, you know, but, but, but the thing is, we can't get usage until we've got uh, a reasonable corpus of questions. So a bit in a, we've been in a bit of a chicken and egg. But, but at least this gives you a sense. That this is not, um, you know, it's, it's not... It's not vacuously small. It's, you know, there's something respectably enough to give some statistical leverage anyway. OK, last, the last piece is about um, what we're trying to do. Firstly, we, we talked about this a little bit before. We're trying to do one thing well, not everything well. Right? So particularly, it's a multiple choice only we talked about, but it's not a whole teaching and learning platform. It just presents multiple choice questions and allows um, students to answer them and gives a lot of analysis information to the teacher that Miles will show you about them. Um, so it is not, therefore, a silver bullet. We've got to have other forms of assessment. It's just one weapon in the armory. And the focus is very much on this low-stakes stuff, which makes it so much easier for us, because there's masses of stuff about confidentiality um, and, uh, and, and whether this is going to be used as a stick for measuring the quality of the teacher or the school that we don't have to worry about, because it's just not, it's not for that, and man manifestly not for that. And all the questions are available to everybody all the time. Um, the second thing I wanted to say just by way of uh, framing the project that we've actually done is about openness. Now, um, the questions that people submit, if we want to crowdsource questions, we have to say, you're not just going to be putting your, your hard work into somebody else's business model, right? Mm -hmm. So firstly, the questions are all Creative Commons licensed. The platform is available for free, forever, to teachers and schools. Um, and, uh, you know, that's commitment that ED them, them, themselves make. And... Uh, um, and it's usable for more of it's not even restricted to the ED platform. You can use the um, uh, you can use a different platform and use iframes to show up you know these questions in in you know in a different teaching and learning platform. Um, all the data that we've been discussing at some length is available to anybody, not just us, in anonymized form. Um, you know to bona fide researchers. Um, and another another way to um, uh, think about the uh, the openness question is I, I think I find this is a helpful analogy the so traditional approach to building question banks is, is kind of a bit like um, writing proprietary software you know Microsoft writes uh, Microsoft Word and it's secret to Microsoft and the, you know that, that code base is Microsoft's intellectual property or it's a bit like writing the Encyclopedia Britannica we co pay authors to write really good articles quantum is like more like open source software in which all of the source is open it's available for free to everybody and that encourages lots of people to contribute to it um, a bit, you know like Wikipedia like if you like so the sort of ethos of quantum is that it's more like a gift economy we're trying to um, engage the sort of creative you know, urges of uh, you know every teacher and every researcher to you know work together, um, out you know in, in a single place rather than silo ourselves. Yes. You mentioned earlier that ED is a startup. Yes. What happens if ED goes bankrupt? We have a sort of written agreement with them that their code and the data will be made public, you know, in an open source kind of way. Um, so it's sort of part of their articles of association, even. So it's a good question. It's one we worried about a bit. Yes. Is there any, is there any data about what size community you need to generate sufficient critical mass? What size community do we? Yes. What size community do we need to generate enough critical mass? I don't know that. That's actually part of the experiment that we're doing. Um, I think we're hoping that we have got somewhere close to that critical mass now, um, but. But you're right that there is a sort of flywheel effect. If it's too small, you don't get enough, uh, you know, then the question mark is not big enough to pull in teachers. You, there's a sort of positive cycle, a positive feedback effect that, uh, that we, uh, I think, are approaching now, but we don't have data on. And it might vary by subject or I don't know how it would vary. That's our goal. Yes? Um, what's the catch for <laughs> What's the catch for? 
Well, uh, let, me let me tell you some catches. Miles will tell you some catches. I'll tell you one. Teachers are busy, and they don't like having to you know, uh, get something new into their brains. They're bombarded all the time with people saying, here's a good idea that you can use in your classroom that will make your life better. They get hundreds of those kind of messages every day. right? Now, I think this one really might make their life better, but of course, that's what everybody else says to them, too. Right? So, it's, uh, so getting to adoption is quite hard. Yes? Could I yeah. ask, <coughs> is there a role? So this is a, an exciting prospect, but in Cambridge assessment, perhaps we also think there might be a role for an exquisitely designed formative test, which is really carefully thought through by highly trained experts. Mm -hmm. Are you testing that hypothesis? Because well, with all your data, could you run an experiment that demonstrates there is no difference between the two, or that we may still have a business? Oh, yeah, could. <laughs> <laughs> yes, are we going to put Cambridge assessment out of business? Well, I think Tim presumably hopes not. But um, is there, So the question is, is there a role for a carefully designed, an expert designed test that would sort of function better, in some ways better than quantum? And are we making that comparison? No. I mean, not, not, I mean, as in we're not making that comparison at the moment. Remember, this is a terribly sellotape and string kind of thing. It's quarter million pounds over two years, incredibly small. But it's this, you know, within, it's a good time to ask this question because within this kind of ethos, this is absolutely open to partnership. And I, indeed, I was speaking to, is it Tom, Tom Branwell? Yes, your um, director of research. And saying, you know, how could we work together to answer research questions like that about this? So, yes, please. Give me your card. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, the last thing is that this, we are actually being quite ambitious. I have focused on computing because that is our guinea pig. To computing teachers are hungry, and they are, um, uh, they're also somewhat tech savvy. So they're quite a good, they're, but they're particularly, they're hungry for this kind of stuff. But actually, if this hypothesis holds, right, then it will work you know, in any subject, in any year, in any country. Right? So it's a short world domination is beckoning. Um, but of course, there are, um, uh, you know, and, and moreover, the, um, you know, the, the data, we're, we're talking about using it for rationalities, as we've discussed, there are lots of things you might ask about this data that we're not yet asking. So we're quite ambitious in what this could do, but plainly, uh, you know, there's a long way to go before it actually meets any of these promises. But that's partly why it's exciting to talk to all of you, because maybe some of you will say we could maybe help, help you think about some of these larger scale things. But I just want to frame the, you know, the ambition as being pretty big, while our short term focus is pretty sharp. OK, I'm going to want to hand over to Miles, because I've been talking in big terms about you know, what, what we're trying to do overall. But in, ter in terms of what, does it act what actually happens in the classroom, how can we use this stuff to improve teaching and learning? And there, I can't say anything, because I've never been, well, I have been in a classroom. Um, but uh, Miles actually is a teacher trainer, right? That's his job. And so he knows a million times more about what happens in classrooms than I do. Um, so, Simon, thank you very you much. Um, schools, much of that time as an ICT teacher as was, three years as a primary head teacher, that was quite enough, thank you very much. I now work at the University of Roehampton, training the next generation of outstanding teachers. We've been using quantum with our trainees, getting them to think a little bit more about assessment and about what makes a good question for assessing computing. I'm not going to talk about that, I'm going to talk in more general terms about the use of multiple choice questions, firstly. Now, I suspect there are many of you in the room for whom this case has already been made, but let me explore with you just a few usage scenarios. Why use multiple choice questions? Because despite what we said earlier about wanting to assess project work, and I hold by that, I also think that these are very versatile types of questions. I cannot, in a multiple choice question, ask, write a program. But I can, in a multiple choice question, ask what's the best line, what's the best command to put in here? I can say, where's the bug in this code? I can say, I can ask questions around algorithmic efficiency. I can ask questions around some of the deep ideas of computer science in the format of a multiple choice question. We believe that these are reasonably reliable questions, that it's not down to the person who's marking these. These can be marked in a very objective sort of way. If we repeat questions around the same idea, we get very similar answers over time. And we think this is a reasonably valid approach to assessment. You're welcome to call 
that into question. You know, is this really just testing how well somebody is trained to answer multiple choice questions? We don't think so. If it's a good question, yes, I'll acknowledge that mon monkeys can get these right 25% of the time. More importantly, for the busy, hardworking teacher, these are easy to mark and easy to analyze. In fact, they're so easy to mark and so easy to analyze that a dumb machine can do both of those things. And for a teacher, we think that's a tremendously useful thing. Daisy Christodoulou, who is part of the Macintosh Commission, says, use the questions to guide the content there. If you've got good questions, then rather than trying to judge against some sort of very abstract, very vague criteria, you know that the student has learnt the thing when they can answer questions on that thing reliably and, with, 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 and correctly. Um, Dylan William talks about the notion of the hinge question that after you've introduced the idea to your class, you need to kind of pause at that point and check that everybody is travelling with you. You know, just picking one or two out of the room and saying, do you know, what's, what's your answer to this isn't good enough. You want some way of getting everybody to respond to that and some way of telling whether they've understood the idea that you've just explained. And we think multiple choice is a really good way of doing this. Hold up the little whiteboard, hold up the, 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 the what is it, the pixel... Um, Click a card and, and to show your answer, or just hold up a coloured card to, to indicate what it is. You as a teacher can tell at a glance. In computer science education over in the States, they have this thing called peer instruction as a methodology there. You don't, you're not interested in using this as an assessment approach, but much more as a teaching approach. You put the interesting question up on the screen at the beginning of the lecture or even before the lecture and then get students to talk to one another about what they think the answer is to that question. Then and only then get them to vote and have the plenary discussion about it. We can use multiple choice questions in that way too. They've got reasonably good evidence that this seems to work in terms of that as a pedagogic approach actually improves test scores on more traditional papers. Over in software engineering, they have this thing. We have this thing called test-driven development. Okay, Very, very quickly... So you're working in the Agile software house, you're producing software for your client, you've got a program that works for the client's specification. Client comes along and says, oh, it's great, we love the software, but it, wouldn't it be nice if it also did this? This point, your every wish is to go off and code the new thing and ship that to the client. Test-driven development says, don't do that just yet. Write the test program, the little bit of code which tests whether your program does the thing, First, in order to do that, you have to have a really good understanding of what it is that the client actually wants. Then put your existing code through the test suite, and it should fail at that point because you haven't actually written the new code yet. If it passes at that point, job done, ship the code, send the invoice, you don't need to worry about anything. Okay, then go off and write the new code, and because you're a brilliant software engineer, when you put it through the test suite the second time, it will pass with flying colours, and look, you've written the feature that the client asked for. How do you know you've done that? Because it passed the test programme that you'd written. And at that point, we do a certain amount of refactoring. We look for a more efficient way of doing this, but we've already got working code at that point. Miles, that's fascinating, but what's that got to do with teaching? Well, do you not think we should do the same thing ourselves? We've got a list of features to implement on the hardware in front of us, yeah? Shouldn't we first test whether they already understand the thing? In order to do that, we have to have a pretty good understanding of what the thing is. So test first, then teach the thing. And because you're brilliant educators, they will pass, of course, the second time round, okay? If not, a little bit of debugging helps. If anybody asks, if Ofsted or senior leadership or whoever says, where is evidence that this class have made progress or this child has made progress, they couldn't do it, I taught it, they could do it. Is it really any more complex than that? You know, they couldn't do it, I taught it, they could do it. At that point, of course, we want to sort of make that something which they can bring to mind more accurately, which is easier to recall, where it's pretty much an automatic thing, where it fits better into existing mental schema. Yes, sir? You seem to be suggesting that human understanding of a concept or an idea or a skill is a pass-fail thing. Is it really? I don't think it is quite that simple. But if you've got a good question and they can answer the question right, you know, that's, that's a fairly good indication that they've understood that idea, that they've retained that particular factoid. I want the application stuff as well, but I also want my students to know things, to understand things. So, you're, so this is about knowledge, not understanding. Ooh, 
subtle, important distinction. <laughs> Can it not be about both? Well, let's have, a look at, let's have a look at some questions. And there's, of course, a continuum here. But perhaps we get to that through asking more and more sophisticated, harder and harder questions that some of the difficult, understanding the difficult concepts relies on understanding the simpler ones, the less complex ones. Bear with me. I'll show you some questions. I may yet persuade you. OK, the other thing a lot of teachers, and particularly a lot of senior leadership, want to know is, how are my students doing? How do they compare with the ex age-related expectations of the national cohort? Now we've got a lot of students doing quantum questions. We can start to make that judgment. I'm going to return to this slide later on. But in the blue there is the class to whom this particular quiz, this collection of 50 questions, was given in the green is children across the nation of about the same age, or across the world of about the same age, and thus we can compare our class with the overall class, and 36% for this class against 43% for 10 to 12-year-olds suggest, okay, room for improvement there. We, as, as uh, Simon has already said, we don't mind students having a go at these questions on their own. There's an iPad app for this, sorry, an iPhone app for this. There's a website which they can register for independently of their school and have a go at questions on their own. The child, the student who learns through attempting close on 8,000 questions, not necessarily a bad thing. For me, working in initial teacher training and indeed working with computing at schools to support the professional development of teachers, we think there's a huge gain here in terms of teachers' professional development. Yes, coming to understand the ideas of how to assess better, but just dealing with the subject matter. Yes, you understand an idea when you have to explain it to somebody else, but perhaps you understand the idea really well when it comes to writing a good question to test whether a student has understood that or knows that thing. Moreover, doing this in a group seems really effective because you put yourself in the place of the learner. The best of our questions are the ones where the distractors, the wrong answers, have been carefully constructed to address the misconceptions which students typically have. And a group of teachers working in a CAS local hub or working with a CAS master teacher seems a really good way of generating questions. Not only does that generate content for our platform, but as I say, we think that's great professional development for the teachers themselves. Finally, the notion of the control trial. This is from um, the Education Endowment Foundation. This is their DIY toolkit, doing an intervention in your own school. Test first, oh, put them to, into two groups, control group, intervention group. Test first, do the intervention with one group, test again at the end and see whether there's a different amount of progress there. Great way, of, we want teachers doing this sort of thing, trying things out. Did the iPad purchase actually make any difference? And to do that, of course, it's really helpful if you've got a set of questions that you can go to so you can focus your mind on the intervention rather than the pre-test, post-test stuff. So there we go, some scenarios where having access to a lot of multiple choice questions might be useful pedagogically as well as for assessment. So after all of that, I think it's probably time to... No, let me show you some of the questions. <laughs> okay, so you get onto the website there. You can sign up as a teacher. You have to give an email address. You can sign up as a student. We encourage students who sign up to um, give us their demographic data there so we can have a look at the difference between boys and girls, the difference over, over ages. You don't have to do that. Teachers can create accounts for their pupils. If you give ED the appropriate permission, they will suck all of the data about your pupils out of your management information system. So I've logged in. I've got an account on the system already. And we get into, via this sort of second item down here, these are our questions. These are our 5,600 computer science questions, not as many IT, not as many digital literacy questions as I'd like, but there are some in there, okay? We've got ordered by newest, what type of programming construct is if, elif, and else? That's a very simple knowledge question, is it? Do you know this particular way of describing this? And a lot of these that we've got at the top here seem to be that sort of thing. The following pseudocode, this is my teacher. Um, local to here, by the looks of it. Okay, the following pseudocode is an example of iteration, selection, assignment, sequencing. This is the sort of thing that this teacher was using with their class, I'm guessing that's three days ago now, that's last Friday, 
isn't it? And we can put an answer in. Simon, on the spot here, oh, which course. would you say that is? Iteration, oh, selection, course. assignment or sequencing? Oh dear, B. Okay, so we're going to go for B. And then the lovely thing about this platform is it's not just did you guess the right answer. We're really encouraging students to give a reason for their answer because SPJ... Oops, something is, is doing weird things to me. Says so. How's says so? How's that? Okay, by authority. And we click on the tick there. We are currently hiding the student explanations because we want to go through a moderation process for those as well. Now we've got lots of primary school children on the platform. We're reluctant to just let all of the explanations out there automatically. But at this point, you should see the explanations given by other students in response to this question. We click on the Insight tab here and scroll down, and then you get the data about how that's gone. There's one explanation already in there, and how many responses have there been? Two people have answered the question, and both of them got it right. So this only went live, as I say, last Friday. That's not the most brilliant of examples, is it? Don't do live demos, Mark. OK, so that's <laughs> sorted by newest. Let's go back into the computing collection here. We can sort by other criteria, most likes, most quiz inclusions. Most misconceptions just means the most wrong answers, which I think is really interesting territory. And that brings up questions about question quality as well as question difficulty. We've got the discovery problem now. So with 8,000 questions on the system, how do you find the ones that you really want? So we can drill down through our little tree here, programming questions. I've got, um, oops, sorry. Strange computer. Programming languages here, 806, 160 of them about Scratch. And so again, we've got questions written by teachers. Um, CS732, which broadcaster will make the sprite hide? And it's one of those four answers. Not going to attempt to answer that now. Um, so, and then curating these into quizzes, you've seen that I've, I've favorited or ticked the add to quiz box for some of these. At that point, I can create a quiz there and you assign that to my class or share that with the world. Here is a collection of questions that I've put together. This does feel a little like giving a product demo, but I think you need to see the thing, don't you, as well as hear about the thing. Let's carry on with some of the more interesting questions, though. So finding a question, I've shown you that already. This is an interesting question. I'm not saying it's a quality question. This is one of the Be Bebras Beaver computational thinking challenge. Beaver family have three mobile phones, but none of the batteries have any charge. It takes an hour to fully charge a mobile phone, but this does not need to be done all in one go. The Beaver family only have two mobile phone chargers in the house. What's the shortest time they need to fully recharge the three phones? Okay. Don't have to tell me straight away, but in a moment I'm going to count down to zero. When I hit zero, I just want you to call out A, B, C, or D, okay? So pick one. Monkeys have a 25% chance of getting this right, folks, okay? Let's have a go at this then. Three, two, one, zero. C. I'm getting C's and B's in here, okay? Mm -hmm. At this point, I want to do the show of hands. Who are the B people? Thank you very much. Who are the C people? Oh, my goodness. So shall we see what the answer is? Shall we see what students say to this? Okay, so C is the correct answer. Bad luck with a few B's in the room there. 30% of those answering this question got it right. They said answer C. 43% picked answer B. So B with students, the majority position is B. And we kind of learned in 2016 about majority positions not always being right. Anyhow, you've got <laughs> metrics running over on the side here, haven't you? So this is the latest thing. Now we've got enough responses to enough of these questions. We can get the rationalysis going with this. So we've got, at the moment, to almost entirely meaningless numbers, okay? So the difficulty measure here is kind of on a scale of minus three is very, very easy, through to plus three, which is quite difficult, okay? There are outliers either side of that range. And if you think that's difficult to explain, then have a go at quality, because quality is like a food standards inspection, the way things are going on here at the moment. Zero is fine. Zero means we've not found any problems with this question. Doesn't tell you it's going to be a del delicious meal, just that there are no cockroaches or rats in the kitchen. Okay, the higher the quality number, the more issues there are with this question. And 
for this question, I think what's going on here is this is testing something quite different from what the rest of our computing questions or most of the other computing questions are doing, which are about, you know, which, where does the semicolon go in this particular JavaScript program, for example, or what will happen when this code runs. Whereas this is quite a different sort of thing that it's getting at here. Can you think about the problem, or do you think about a recipe for the solution? My guess is that the B people there were thinking, okay, so it's phone A and B for the first hour, and then phone C for the second hour, yeah? Whereas really all you need to do is think, okay, they've got to give an hour, what is it? Um, an hour's charge to each of three phones. I've got two chargers, so um, three divided by two gives me the hour and a half there, okay? These are the responses we got. I think this is the, these are the incorrect answers. So when we did that give an explanation thing, the ones who got it wrong wrote things like this. You can't charge half a battery. One hour time it takes to fully charge two phones. can charge at the same time, so one hour. Freeze up a charge for the last phone, which will take an additional hour, and three equals two hours. They're thinking in a very procedural way, and perhaps that sort of procedural thinking really helps with the other questions that they answer. The ones who got it right thought about it quite differently. Very long explanation for a simple multiple choice question there at the top. I quite like the succinctness of this. Total charge time, three hours. Each charge you use for 1.5 hours. They're not even thinking of the recipe. They're just thinking about the amount of power that has to go into the phone. So some really interesting insights from the explanations they give. This is a classic question in computer science edu education. I'm not going to make you guess this, but just have a moment to read through it. Consider the following Python code. A is 20, B is 10, A equals B. What are the values of A and B when this program runs? Okay. Somebody said A. Yes, all right, don't tell the others. You know. mm -hmm. Okay, of course it's A. 36% of students got that right. That's actually improved a lot over the years. The first year we had this question in the deck was much lower than that. So I'm thinking perhaps we're getting good at teaching computer science now, or at least this bit of computer science but very even spread across the other three distractors there. Difficulty measure 0.82, quality score of zero. There are no rats, no cockroaches in this question, okay? Quality score of zero is pro probably a good sign for this because it suggests this is broadly speaking in line with how they're doing on the other questions. Yes, sir? I worry about the previous question that given the, their responses, some yeah. of them are getting the right answer without understanding what the oh. question was asking. For the previous question? Yeah. I don't know. Oh, interesting. So, so if they're yeah. doing um, three hours divided, sorry, two hours, um, what's it? Three hours divided three by hours two. Three hours divided by two chargers yeah. equals 1.5 hours. Yeah. They don't understand that there is actually, as you point out, the sequencing. Issue. No, I think they have got it, or at least. I mean, it's, it's something that is interesting about that question. Just being able to abstract from that problem the fact that it's the amount of electricity. The recipe is unimportant. Well, but the, the, I would the, say. Co the converse is that um, they've shown a lower bound of 1.5 yeah. hours. Okay. Yes, all Not right. That it's possible. All right. Mm. Yes, if there was an additional constraint that you had to use a charger for an hour at a time, then of course, so it is a lower bound. You're quite right. Yeah. But it's a but, nice declarative yeah. lower bound. I, I think the quality score suggests there are issues with the question. I think quality, high quality scores make for interesting questions. You might not want to put it in a test of computer science knowledge, though. Or indeed, perhaps there's an issue with this, with Bebras's approach to testing computational thinking. Anyhow, as I was saying, this has got better over time. So the first year we had this, March 16 to March 17, I had 26% of students getting it right, which is about as well as monkeys will do on this. For the last year, although we've had fewer responses, we're up to 70% of those are right. Now, is that because I've talked about this question too many times now, or is it because a year further on into the implementation of the curriculum, we're actually getting students to understand how variables work in particular programming languages? We need more data in order to be able to make that comparison, but it's interesting, okay. And there's a famous paper here, Donardian born at 2006, the camel has two humps, subsequently retracted, okay, you need to know that, which says these questions, questions like this, this is the example they give in their paper, 
are brilliant predictors of success in undergraduate computer science exams. So the students who get questions like that right, sort of two weeks into the course, do really well in the final first year exam. The students who get questions like that wrong at the beginning of the course do really badly in the final first year exam. It seems to be a predictor. And the fact that that had a zero quality score, in other words, no cockroaches, no rats, suggests that that performance on that question is in line with how well students are doing across computing as a whole there. OK, we've got another one here. Given the following program, what would be displayed if the user typed in 1? OK, choice equals input, choose 1 or 2. If choice equals 1, print you chose 1. Else print you chose 2. Kind of want to do the 3, 2, 1 thing. Just guess if you're not sure. You might want to say what language is that in. I'd say that's written in Python, if you asked me. And I would say that's a 1, not an I at the top. There are issues with the question format. OK. OK, everybody going to, willing to call out? Here we go. 3, 2, 1, 0. A. A. <laughs> a. I've got a C. Did anybody go for D? D is a popular answer amongst students, okay? Now, this is, you know, there are issues with this question. Firstly, the font causes problems. Is that an I? Is that a 1? Actually, actually, that makes it slightly easier. What is this really testing? Is it testing your understanding of control flow in a program? Or is it testing your understanding of Python interprets anything you type in as a string? and comparing the string 1 to the integer 1, it won't match. And so it will go down the other bit of the else loop and say you chose 2 at the end because we've not met the condition there. So A is, I think, the correct answer. You chose 2 will be what the computer says. A is the correct answer. Quarter of students attempting this get it right. D was hugely popular. You'd expect it to be D, wouldn't you? Yeah, you chose 1. Yes, I typed in 1. So you'd expect that, and thus we have issues with the quality of the question, which doesn't come as a surprise, and a really high difficulty metric, because it looks like an easy question, but it's actually quite a difficult, quite a subtle question there. What's going on? Well, partly it's a knowledge about Python's type system, which is a hard thing to teach, but there's also this thing which Roy P. talks about. Isn't that a gorgeous photo of him, by the way? Which is all about this superbug, that the computer should know what I meant even if it just does what I said. And thus you're getting a, I think this question gets at that really quite subtle idea of tracing through the program and understanding exactly what the machine will do. Um, we get interesting distinctions between different groups of students attempting the same question. So forgive me for mentioning this. The boys actually did better than the girls on this question. I've not checked whether that's statistically significant. But look at the distractors. The girls were really tempted by B and C here. The boys were much less tempted by B and C. And B and C were the invalid input and the nothing at all. I think it's interesting. I'm not saying, saying it's significant. And we've got a similar thing going on around age here. Younger students find this hard. Older students find it still hard. You know, it's still 23% in terms of the number who got it right. But there's a, there's a gap there between how well younger students and older students do with this. I'm not going to talk you through that one, but it's there as well. We need to teach code tracing. OK, finally, um, what is it that a teacher can learn from this sort of quantum data? Here is one set of 50 questions. We've curated 50 of these together into a, we call it a baseline quiz. End of key stage two, better still, beginning of key stage three. How have they done at primary school? What, what's my starting place? And then you assign that to the class. They have a go at the questions. And there in one plot is how well they did on those questions. Question 44 at the end here, that's a pretty good measure. That's sort of like 8% of them got question 44 right. I don't need to worry about that topic. I maybe need to worry about these students. Question 29 at the beginning here, which if memory serves is what's the difference between the internet and the web, only two of my students got that right. That's on the primary curriculum. Clearly wasn't taught there. We get to see the question by question analysis. We have this lovely little plot there. Look, those are the two students who got it right. And then we go through the list and see harder ones. Those of you who are familiar with rationalysis will be familiar with this sort of plot. 
Um, okay, over the top here, we have the questions ordered from the hardest on the left-hand side through to the easiest on the right-hand side there. We have our students placed in rank order of those who did most poorly on this test through to those who did best on this test. This question here, relatively easy one, loads of our students have got this right. This one here, very hard question, only one student got it right. And interesting, not judging by their test scores, a particularly able student. I'm worried about this student here who answered only the first question and got it wrong. I think it might have been a problem with the computer. This student skipped lots of them out, what was going on there. Oh, and you have that sort of almost perfect Gutman pattern. I think it's this column here. Almost every question from there on down. Hey, no, that's other direction. Sorry, that was a bad example. <laughs> you have you know, some, question, some questions where um, some students who managed to get almost everything right from one point, almost everything wrong up to that point. So that sort of analysis we can present to teachers very quickly. The comparison we can do, so this is the one I showed you earlier. Teachers very interested in how am my class doing compared to the national cohort, particularly if we're looking at sort of um, expect, you know, the top 5% will get A stars, sorry, grade one at the end of the, the period there. And then comparing, that's looking at all attempts at the questions in the quiz. And this is those questions again looking at how well everybody did when attempting those. The gender differences here, it's not much to talk about, but we've got the data on this. So this one, we had lots more of the girls got right than the boys, and there are going to be other interesting discrepancies. I don't know, does that make it a particularly gendered question? We'd need to look at the question to tell. And again, the age comparison here, and surprising, unsurprisingly, younger students find these questions harder than the older students. <laughs> do. Uh, finally, I'll just give you a moment to copy down the relevant details from the plot there. No, we've got, this is the questions where we've done the rationalysis, difficulty measures, mainly from the minus three to plus three, some outliers at both ends. Most of our questions on that sort of baseline, no rats, no cockroaches, quality measure, but some really disturbingly high, poor quality questions. I'm very curious as to what the outliers are on that particular axis. There. So that's pretty much what we've got. Simon had some questions for you, I think. Oh, I, I, was just, I just left this, this slide as a, um, it would be uh, interesting to, to a, a sort of discussion prompts, though I, you may have uh, uh, questions and observations that you want to make from your own experience. Um, yeah, at the back. Um, I wondered if you had any information about the user's expectation of how they would use this and then actually how they used it. We've got a lot of teachers figuring this out for themselves. We've provided these questions. I think one of the things that we're seeing a lot of use is around setting homework. So I've explained this topic to you. We've done some practical work on this. Here are 10 questions. Here are five questions that you can do for homework and using that as some indication of whether students have understood the idea or not. The hinge point thing works very well, but I think teachers are using that just in the normal context of their lesson. The baseline assessments proved surprisingly popular, though, and it's a good starting point, I think. Isaac, Isaac, mm. Isaac Physics as well. If, if Mark Warner was here, what he'd say is that they, they clocked in Isaac Physics um, the, the day or the time and the time of, of most use, and it's basically um, the, the highest use is as you might expect on Sunday in the evening, um, and, and questioning has then yielded the fact that that's, that's students worrying. So it's really good that they've got something that they can actually address. And Worrying about Monday mornings. Yeah, they're worrying yeah. about Monday. And uh, it's really good that they can have a, a, a set of stimulating questions with hints, with support, that actually help them through the material. Um, I was just wondering from the business point of view, um, how does ED make money and why is it in their interest to host the platform. It's obviously a good idea, yeah, but why are they doing it? There's an excellent question. And I mean, education is a multi, you know, multi-billion pound business. Yeah. So I think it's very reasonable that, that um, people should have businesses that are based on education. Easy's business model, happily, is based on um, parents. So that their sort of, you know, their premium offering is really for parents who can pay an annual subscription to, you know, I think it's still only some tens of pounds per year um, to get 
uh, you know, regular, um, quite detailed reports about what their, what their children, you know, how their children are getting on in each of the subjects. So I really hope this business model works because if it works, it supports their, their offering as of um, free forever. But it's kind of, it's important, I think it's important to be very important for teachers and schools that it should be free at the point of use. And that's, that is potentially quite hard to sustain. But the footnote yes, to that is that it has changed. I mean, the EV started out by thinking that they would charge per use in terms of items. And that quickly, they reviewed that in terms of uh, the take up and so on, and, and moved to a position where they thought that the value added that, that people could legitimately pay for is in the reporting. But, but it varies around the world. I mean, people are really bothered about what kind of monetization is applied to this. To, to make sure that it continues to be available and has quality. Well, but, what, what make it and there are two pieces of it. One is the platform itself, right? And which, which in the end, it's the incremental, the, you know, the, the marginal cost per extra student is, you know, some extra compute cycles and a data center, which are relatively cheap. Um, the, the big thing about the corpus of questions themselves Right, and the, the data on that's that's provided by the cloud, right? So it's very different to Cambridge as, uh, assessment develops some very high quality questions where you might reasonably expect to be paid for those. This is provided by everybody, so it's back to the open source ethos. But nevertheless, the platform does cost, and yeah. Sorry, can you go? Um, I thought the uh, before you talk about the uh, not making this a measure of how competent the teacher or the school is, is is a really good thing because in certain markets not just the UK, but other markets such as India, that's a massive thing. But by monetising it for parents in order to track student progress, isn't that flying in the face of that mantra? It's and not... You've got to make money, so is it that uh, complex? Mm -hmm. I, my understanding was that the, the monetising to parents was a separate offering. It's not about tracking your child's progress at school. Parents have a right of access to that those records under well, some sort of education regulation at the moment and are likely to have something similar under GDPR. This is much more about parents wanting their, their children to do some more questions, about providing a scheme of work through that is my understanding. But I don't work for ED, so I may be wrong. Yes, I mean, you, you should look at ED's Sorry. website, their, their parent thing. I think, I think it is more of the form, um, you know, your child seems to be a bit stuck on this. Here's a bunch of questions that you might like to work through with them on it. Tim. I would usually chair it, but I'm going to let these two chair it. But when you ask a question, could you say who you are and where you're from? And that would be very helpful both to speakers and to the audience. Assessment. Um, so I was wondering that if the students are the ones who are using the, the assessment kind of, the question bank really, um, do they get any feedback as to why they got the question wrong? So I know that there are other ones that students can use, and if, say, they've got the question wrong, say, the, you know, the choice is one rather than two, they'd get some idea as to why that's wrong, because you can see if a child carries on or a student keeps going through them without any feedback. It might be difficult for them to learn, particularly if they don't... Either they're doing it, um, you know, at home, or they don't have time to sit down with a teacher to ask them why they got it wrong. So I wondered if that, yeah, plan to incorporate that in the future. So there is that responses from people who've got it right feature built into it, which I couldn't show you today because of the issue with moderating students' responses. They've also got access to the insights here. So you can look through this, and here you see the explanations given by the question author for what the incorrect, well, for the, the four responses. So C is the correct answer, and then in this case, the author has written some suggestions as to what to think about dependent on the, the incorrect responses. So there's a bit of feedback there. You also have, as I say, have those explanations given by other students. The ones who've got it right seem to have just ticked the I just guessed button, <laughs> button here, which is not helpful. helpful. <laughs> and indeed, the same is true of the other one. So that wasn't a brilliant example either, was it? It's unusual. <laughs> so you have those responses written by other students and for the, most of the questions which we've got from Computing at Schools members, we've got the, quest, res, the explanations given by the original author as well. Personally, I think it's a really clever idea to essentially crowdsource the explanations from students themselves mm. in, at the same moment that they're answering the question. I think that's really, of course, it's not perfect. A student could survive, provide a completely bogus explanation for a correct answer, but it's kind of very neat. The, um, 
Uh, but we haven't, we're, we're not at the level that, say, Isaac, uh, Isaac Physics is at, at which they have you know, handwritten, curated hints for wrong answers, leading to, you know, with suggestions for further work you might do and other questions. That's more, you know, I think ED have aspirations to go in that direction, but you can see that it would require more work per question. And at the moment, our focus is on let's explore how far you can get with the very low barrier to entry, lots of questions um, approach. They're not mutually exclusive. Uh, sorry, yes, this gentleman has the uh, microphone, but then could you, uh, could you thank, hand it to the lady at the back when we're done? Uh, thank you. Uh, so, as far as I understood, the rash analysis happens automatically, yeah? Mm -hmm. Semi-automatically. Um, it's, it's a job which a, 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 an operator has to run at the moment. We've not got it feeding directly into the machine. Yeah. And uh, my another question is, as I'm not from UK, uh, there is a big need in, our, in my country for this kind of uh, you know, uh, help from teachers to teachers. So uh, can this uh, platform be run for uh, languages other than English and uh, for subjects other than IT, computing? Yeah, uh, absolutely. That's, that's part of our ambition. Right, you can upload questions tomorrow in any language you like. Um, and what about non-Romanic uh, non scripts? Well, at the moment, they're just images, so you can manage them too. I mean, of course, there's disadvantages to that too. Um, but, but I wouldn't say that. I mean, they, then you'd want to be able to select by language, and, so, and you can do drill down by the subject. At the moment, you can't, do by, you can't select by the language in which the question is written. But that would be part of the grander ambition, yes. Um, that's what, you know, a, a big repository of questions should be able to do that. And you could imagine a whole industry translating questions from one language to another, once we, know, we knew which the good ones were. There was a lady at the back who had her Thank you, uh, Celia Hoyles, UCL Institute of Education. I think it's really exciting what you're doing, and I have two questions. Uh, one, ultimately, we all know in, in schools, uh, everything is dominated by assessment. Do you think this might be a liberating somehow to get away from that, so we won't have to be complete weight for all the examinations, we can have some sort of crowdsourcing these questions, and everything can be public? Th that's one question. And the other, I wanted to say, I want Miles's point about using these questions or creating such questions being a really important part of professional development. I'd have thought that is absolutely fantastic. And more, the more we do, the better. But I just wondered if you, why you're getting involved in that. Do you somehow feel this is a way of getting away from all this teaching to the test and all that stuff? Or do you, um, is that just something completely Again, I mean, I worry about showing that test-driven development <laughs> slide yeah. because... Essentially, that's saying teaching to the test isn't a bad thing. This is what software engineers do in a test-driven development environment. They code in order to pass the test that they've written. But I think the significant thing is they've also, they have written the test there. And, you know, I made the transition from school to university, and one of the things I love about my new job, I'm doing this eight years now, is that we get to create our own assessments. And we're there to teach, but we're also there to, to assess whether they have learnt these things. And I think getting teachers a lot more involved in the assessment cycle can't not be a good thing. And you know, teaching to the test, perhaps, but if you've written the test, and the test embodies exactly what it is you want your students to have learnt, that might not be always a bad idea. Okay. Sorry, what was your first question again, Celia? Sorry, Tim, sorry. Tim, sorry. Yeah. I was, was going to because I want to return to this issue of, well, what kind of evidence for, for this being supportive of good pedagogy? Yeah, your question. Is yes. that? Mm -hmm. and, and, and actually, Celia, you've got a lot to answer for on this one. Um, because you, you, you kindly opened up um, the centre when you had those Hong Kong textbooks. And that was really very important. Um, so the analysis of those textbooks um, identified some very carefully curated questions associated with each construct in each chapter. That, that in turn led to us scrutinizing all of the work globally on, on the frequency of the asking of questions in highly interactive teaching, even where that teaching looks highly didactic. Um, and so Lucy Crehan's most recent observational work in, in Shanghai showed that, that, that although the, question, the, the, the classrooms are traditionally considered to be, by external observers, um, naive observers, highly didactic. In fact, the teaching is highly interactive in relationship to eliciting responses from children, 
revealing their thinking through including a very high frequency of well-structured and well-chosen questions in the interaction in the class. And some of these questions go back actually centuries. That's what's really interesting. Um, and, and I think that, that that's very strong evidence from Finland, uh, from Shanghai, from Japan, from all the work that, that James Stigler did, uh, in terms of, you know, based on very, very detailed observation of lessons, that high interactivity involves a lot of question asking. And, and what we want to do is try and capture this. We're asking <coughs> teachers, what kind of questions do you use in the classroom? And we're mm -hmm. asking those to be submitted and turned into the format within mm -hmm. this, this, this item bank. So we really want this, this, this feed in from highly effective pedagogy into assessment and back into pedagogy. Yes, Quantum's um, strap line at one stage, which I quite like, was tests worth teaching to. crowdsourcing assessment and teaching and the national curriculum, you started off by saying this will match these aims mm -hmm. of the national curriculum. What happens when the crowd decides a tangent to the national curriculum? And can we essentially crowdsource from these data a national curriculum? <laughs> so it's perfectly true. I mean, so, so it's an excellent question because it's um, uh, the... Um, what the questions that are submitted might not reflect that you know that we could, could have lots of questions on computing that were about um, you know the cap capital capitals of uh, um, obscure countries, right? So, uh, uh, but what to do about that? I mean, there's no way automatic analysis is going to check that, right? But what we want to do about that, I think, is to say that questions are kind of like the raw material. They might not, for example, there might be questions that were really useful for the um, national curriculum in Australia, but just not happen to fit the one in this country, right? So then, then what you want to do is to start to, and now this is a human exercise, to gather high quality questions into curated quizzes and sequence of quizzes, schemes of work, or schemes of testing, if you like, that can be where, and there you might want to have, this is another place where um, you, know, you could imagine some high quality, uh, you know, thoughtful input, to say this you know, sequence of quizzes does embody the national curriculum. I mean, you know, some of the questions might not, but this lot does. Um, and that, of course, would be an, an, you know, an exercise of judgment by the author or by the organisation that did that, and there might be more than one of those. I'm not sure I really want the DFE to bless cert certain um, schemes. I think it would be, it's enough to have the national curriculum, and we can have you know, different instantiations of it. But I, I, I do think that an element of this curation, curation into quizzes and sequences thereof, is going to prove to be important. You just need to have the raw material first. What we're seeing from this is an interpretation by teachers of the national curriculum. So, mm. you know, they're writing questions. Mm. I don't think they're always getting that right. And so yeah. we've got a feedback mechanism on these questions. But, you know, we've got abstraction is a crucial concept in computer science, but it's not well understood by teachers or indeed by students in my experience. Well, it's very abstract. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, you know, the question up on the screen there, yeah, it's kind of got something to do with abstraction, but most of the abstraction questions which we've got on the platform aren't really getting at this notion of computational abstraction. So if got, folks have got nothing better to do this evening, come and write some good abstraction questions <laughs> for us, which really do capture this. Uh, Roy Cross from an organisation that's not allowed to work in Russia at present. Yes. Um, you mentioned curation, Simon, yes. and this is something that the students could do, isn't it? Ask them which are the good questions, ask yeah. them to explain why they're good questions, put together a quiz. Yeah. Are students so allowed to upload questions to this bank? Yeah. That's one of the reasons why we've got to be very careful about the pre-moderation of, you know, there are no rude words, there are no rude pictures. The right answer is the right answer. That's the third criteria. <laughs> so, yes. yes. And getting students to write questions. I should have included that in the, the sort of slide about pedagogy. It seems to work really very well. And they could probably explain why they're good questions too if they're once yeah. they're... It's the, yeah. the misconceptions yeah. is the crucial thing to this. You know, it's easy enough to write a question and get the right and give the right answer. It's thinking through the three wrong answers where the really interesting learning seems to take place. I think you get interesting things out of that. The question for me would be how, you, how would you incentivize students 
to spend time and thought on developing good questions and explaining why they're good. Right, but students, in my experience, and indeed in my, you know, my personal experience as a student, are sort of kind of rather task oriented <laughs> towards, you know, what. So, but with perhaps with suitable incentive structures, right, but even quite modest ones, you're. The dads. The, da the dads, right, could tell them. That's your homework. Right, yeah. That's your homework. Maybe it could be. That's right. So, if teachers started setting, write a question as your homework, that could be a, that's an incentive structure. Yeah, that's what I mean by incentive structures. Just some way to say, but they're not really just going to do it for fun, right? Uh, extremely yes. odd students. <laughs> I'm conscious that we're kind of into injury time, Tim, but I'm, I'm we're happy to um, uh, try to but actually maybe. Yes, there's a gentleman just beside you. There. Hello, um, Oliver Stacey from NFER. I'm just interested, you're talking about the adoption of this. Um, has, it, has Nick Gibble or the Department for Education uh, kind of, uh, no, they can't endorse it, but has it kind of encouraging people to use it? Because obviously you've got some good numbers there, but I'm sure you want more, more schools, more teachers to use it. We um, certainly do. So I think it's, um, uh, as I said, teachers are for very good reasons conservative about what they adopt. Um, and so... Uh, Mechanisms for adoption that I see before, so you know, D DFE is one, but I think there are lots of others available to us, like working with awarding organisations, because if a teacher is thinking I'm teaching towards OCR, GCSE, for example, if the OCR's materials that said, you know, do these tests and you'll probably be good at our GCSE, right, it's, this isn't a GCSE question, it's part, that, that would be, that would drive adoption quite a bit, and, and we could do that with, you know, all, all the awarding organisations, uh, City and Guilds, for example, King of but um, uh, Academy Chains is another Right, so that some of them are quite thoughtful about their teaching and learning, but they're also quite... So anybody, any academy chain teaching and learning sort of folk here? I'd love to talk to some of them. They're quite difficult to, to sort of get into um, from the outside. Um, we have been talking to the Department for Education, um, and Nick would, would be... I'm sorry, Tim would be a better authority on Nick Gibbs' um, inner workings than, than <laughs> I am. But we've essentially proposed to them that, we, that they should give us some money to deepen and broaden across subjects what Quantum is doing. You may... Have a better insight well, than me. Well, let me summarise. I mean, it, it was it was recommended to the government in the Macintosh report, and um, it's a good idea to have item banks available for a number of subjects and computer science in particular. So, so there is a there is a, a policy imperative there. There's a policy imperative. We made them a proposal, and they haven't said no yet. Is, <laughs> but they have not said no for over a year. So, if you see what I mean, so these processes happen slowly. Was the, um, yes. Um, Anne Sparrowhawk, now retired ex CIE. Yeah. Oh, sorry, C A I E. <coughs> um, anyway, uh, I spend a lot of my uh, working life looking at computers and education. And one of the things I would observe is that there are almost no platforms that have ever been successful working across primary and secondary schools. Mm. And one of the things you might want to think about is whether a skin for a primary school might look different from that for the secondary school. I fully appreciate the questions might not necessarily divide tidily that way, but it might actually make adoption by schools somewhat easier. I think we've got, there, there are bigger challenges with primary than simply the look and feel of this. That on the whole, secondary school teachers, because they're very much focused on GCSE and indeed A-level, they're used to questions as a way of assessing subjects. In primary, once you move away from the core of the curriculum, it's teachers, the teachers I work with seem to be much more persuaded this is about you know, the organic assessment of project work of using criteria and looking through these. Making the case that this is a sensible way to assess primary computing isn't simply about the look and feel of the site. It's about a mind change. To my mind, the persuasive argument for primary school teachers is this is so much easier than marking a stack of scratch projects. You know, I want to have the scratch projects too, but I can get a good measure, I think a good measure, of how well my students are doing, my pupils are doing with computing by just giving them you know, 10, 15 of these questions at some appropriate points during the year, I think. It's 6.15. Losing people here and there for very good reasons, because we advertised yeah. finishing at six, didn't we? Yeah, so thank you very much indeed, audience, for some very rich questions. Um, thank you, Miles, and, and thank you, of course, for all the effort that you've put into the project itself, along with colleagues. Um, thank you, Simon. Um, Simon is 
sorry, I asked you to introduce yourself, but you didn't. <laughs> um, so, so Simon is um, very prominent in research in Microsoft itself and is responsible for many of the mechanics behind some of the applications that you'll use on a day-to-day -day basis. But, and he's given unstintingly his time and commitment to this project. It's been a, 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 an inspiration working with you, actually, Simon, in terms of this is not your day job, and it's something that you've done philanthropically on the side with great commitment, and it's, it's extraordinary that it's up and running with such figures behind it. So that's wonderful. So thank you very much indeed, both of you, and if we can show our appreciation, that's great. <laughs> And, and thanks to all the crew who've been filming and making sure that the, um, the lecture and the questions are available to a much, much wider audience. And, and just, to, just to remind you that, that you will, you of course, will be have, uh, have many communications reminding you of this, but on the 9th of October, it'll be Chris Winch uh, talking about um, models of teacher expertise, which, and it's really very, very important to address this, I think, these days in this discussion of, of high workload. So, Thank you very much indeed, Simon. Thank you very much indeed, Mars, and thank you very much indeed, audience. Yeah, thank you all. Yeah.